You probably all know it, I mean, in, in one sense, just to think about it. Just our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It, it's, a, it's a principle that drives so much of our lives, and in our world today, just this idea of of finding out what that is and trying to provide a society that brings that. And there is great blessing in that, but also confusion. I think about it, you guys probably know. I mean, in one sense, defining, okay, what is it, a right? I mean, we're saying there are inalienable rights that are to be there. What are rights? Well, Webster's Dif Dictionary defines it this way. That which is due to anyone by just claim. Legal guarantees, moral principles. It says a right is something that's, that's due to you, that, that's due to yours because it's the right thing. I mean, in one sense, that's a little bit clear, but maybe you're already aware. That's a debated thing among our culture. What, what's actually our rights? What, what rights do we have? I mean, how does that apply into all the ramifications that are there? And there are political questions in that and practical questions. I just want to tell you it's a big deal. And not even wanting to go into those right now, but trying to figure out what that is is so much of where our world is. But I want to give it to you in a kind of a simple way. That if you could think about it this way, part of what we're going to understand in this chapter is to have to, the right to do, to do something is not at all the same thing is to be right in so doing it. To have the right to do something that is your right is not at all the same thing as to be the right thing that you would do. And sometimes that clarity needs to come all together differently. We have a world right now that is pressing, that is demanding. I have rights. Give me my rights. Treat me according to what's right and what's fair and what I, you know, that's what I want. And I want to tell you, God is calling us to something so much more. Now, that question that we're going to be wrestling through, let me give you a little bit of background. Where we're thinking about it, it has to do with things that, well, you could kind of define as gray areas. That's where we are in 1 Corinthians. As Paul is writing to uh, the church there in Corinth, he's answering questions that they had asked him. In 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, there's, there's one large question that's being addressed through a number of different facets, and it has to do with gray areas. Now, you probably know what I mean by this, but let me just give you a quick understanding. What I mean by gray area is there are certain things that are black and white, things that we absolutely know. I mean, we don't have any doubt about it scripturally. There are things that are absolutely right, things that we don't have any doubt that God wants, that scripture is abundantly plain about things that he has for our lives, to know him, to, to draw near. I mean, these are not questions. These are statements. There are other things that are absolutely wrong things that the Bible tells us they are that, that they're black, that they are <coughs> things like adultery or homosexuality or stealing. I mean, those things are not in question here. And in the midst of where we are in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 and 10, don't get confused because he's not talking about those. If you've been with us in Corinthians, you're really, you get that because he just caught, talked about it. In chapters from 5 and 6, just dealing with sin that was in the church and telling them there are just lifestyles that are absolutely not possible for a, a Christian to walk in, that they just absolutely just opposite everything we are. That's not what we're talking about. There are things in life that, again, Scripture is plain about, and we don't have to sit there and wonder. I you know, wonder what God has. But then there are gray areas, lots and lots of gray areas, things where the Bible isn't plain. It's not clear how, what he has for us, questions that, that people have about style and, and, and practice in, in different parts of their lives. And whether you recognize it or not, there is probably not a week that goes by that in some fashion, that's not a question you're wrestling with. So what does God have me to do? How do I do this? How do I make this decision? Especially when the Bible's not clear about it. I mean, if it's clear about it, it's like, well, I, I, you know, it says right here, you know, thus says the Lord, the Bible's there. But where it's not, how do I do the right thing? How do I know what God has? That's what Paul was dealing with, dealing with these gray areas, dealing with what they looked like, dealing with all the different things that would be there, dealing with all the different parts that would be there. That's the kind of questions he's answering. Now, last week we talked about it that he begins to answer their question because they'd premised this question by asking him about meat sacrificed to idols. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, we did that last week, and so if you don't understand what that is, 
It's a great idea of a technological age. Go back and get the message, catch it online or however it works because it would take a long time to explain it. But culturally, it was a really big deal. Can a Christian eat meat after it had been sacrificed to an idol? It was very much a part of their culture. Paul seeks to answer that question in a number of ways. First of all, he says there's knowledge that we can have. There's a, there's a way to understand, and this we know there's only one God. I mean, there's no other gods. It's not going to hurt us to eat those things. It's not like we're afraid of those kinds of things. But then he calls us to something so much more. That he calls us to embrace love, that we be not just making our decisions based off of understanding, but after care and loving other people, and concerned about our life being one that would stumble others and being driven by love. I mean, that's really what he's telling us so far, that when we wrestle with those questions, there's a way of dealing with it with knowledge, but there's a greater part of dealing with love. Now, that's hopefully helpful because that moves right into where we are this evening because now that he's addressed that and called us to this high place of love, he presses a little bit deeper and he deals with this area of rights, this area where, in one sense, that people have a tendency to deal with their rights. And, and he does so just in a profound way, in a great way. He's going to take the first half of the chapter and just establish with us that the rights that he has, they're really rights. And again, I, I know that you get this, but I want to back up for a moment, and I want to tell you again, I know. I mean, I absolutely know that some of you, you're wrestling through this right now. Some of you had a conversation this week, or you will have it next week. And that'll be the question, because if you did a web search, you would find out there's every, you know, you know animal rights, people rights, you know, you know, feminine rights, you know, male rights, children's rights. I mean, all, I mean what are my rights? What are my rights, and, and how do I get what's right? And those are key questions within a society, I'm sure. But Paul's saying in one sense, he wants us to understand how that works out in his life. And again, he wants to begin with this by helping us understand that he has legitimate and even biblical rights. Notice with me as it tells us there in verse, cha- verse 1 of chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Paul's letting us know that he has rights. He has rights that are due him as an apostle. Now, there's a lot of stuff we could go into that because in one sense, there's a unique role that Paul filled in that. Him and the the early disciples who were called apostles by Jesus, church founded in them, there are just uniqueness to that that's never repeated. And understand that in one sense, Paul was a part of that. He had just personally seen the Lord. There are qualifications that fell in the midst of that. Having said that, I don't think that's entirely where he's pressing. See, the, the word apostles is a, a fascinating word in Scripture for any of you that want to pursue that on your own. It literally means to be one that's sent, you know, to, to, to be one that's sent forth. It's really a biblical term that would be really the same term that we would use for the idea of missionary. You don't really find the word missionary in the Bible, and, you know, but really the concept is there. And in that sense, there are those who still function like that. They go out as missionaries, taking the gospel into brand new territories. Just bre- just, just, that's really the role of it, not a power play, but in many ways, just this place of, of serving and seeking to do that. Paul says, I am this. And, and, he, and he says, I am this. And even if people doubted it, even if people questioned it, because he'll talk more later in 2 Corinthians that some were, they knew because he'd planted the church. The people that he's writing to, these are, this is a church that he had planted, that he'd spent over a year and a half of his life planting a church there in Corinth, and God had, had saved many, and, he, and he, his fruit was found in them, and so they knew it. I mean, he says, even if others doubt it, I am, and you know that. And then he helps us understand that out of that, he has definite rights, that, that rights would be there. He says, my defense to those who examine me is this, do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as, other, as also the other apostles, the brothers of our Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Well, again, you catch it. He mentioned it over and over. We have rights. It says rights in one sense to, to eating and drinking, probably in some sense is talking about some of the very issues, eating meat, sacrifice to idols, things that were there. Right to be married. Paul had entered into it as Barnabas as well had chosen to be single to serve God in their singleness that was chapter 7 where he explained that and then even more than that to to be supported in so doing 
Some Bible commentaries, by the way, take all of those three, those three things and point them all to the last idea of support, and there is some concept in that, but either way, the point that he's just establishing is, I have a right to this. I mean, these are legitimate rights, and to make sure we get it, again, he's going to explain it as clear as he can. Now, please hear me clearly. What he's about to explain to us, and he goes way out of his way to do it to make sure that we get it, they are rights. They're not wrongs. I mean, he's going to explain why it's right, and in most contexts, in most situations, it is right that it is so. That he's going to look upon these things, and there's no sense that he's creating another list of what's right and wrong, and now saying it's wrong to do these things. No, what he's absolutely explaining is, I have full right to this. I mean, there, there's a full right that I should be able to enjoy these things, that whether it be the pleasures that were there, or the marriage, or, or support from the, the church, that they would support him financially as he was serving them. They were legitimate rights, and they're, they are so. In most situations, again, it would be both expected and right that it's there. Now, as he wants us to understand that, he gives us a number, number of perspectives that help us to see that. For starters, just kind of a natural just perspective that it makes sense that it's so. It says in verse 7, whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruits, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? He says, who does that? I mean, whoever goes to war and just says, hey, you know, I'm going to supply my own, my own source to doing that. That's not the way it works. You sign up to go to war. You know, the government becomes in and, and, and now they, they, they provide you all that's necessary. It's the way it works. We understand that. If you plant a vineyard, you're expecting to eat of it. If you have a flock, it makes altogether sense that you would be able to enjoy the, 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 the parts of that, that parts of that would be just who you are. It's just natural that there's a sense that because you're investing into something, that you're living your life that way, that there should be and ought to be a response back to that. It says in one sense we see it everywhere in life, but it's more than that. It's not just that natural, it's biblical. Notice what he says. Verse 8, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen that God is concerned about, or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. Thus it is written that he who plows should plow in hope that he who threshes should thresh in hope that he should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Again, he's letting us know in one sense, this is a place that, that the Bible itself can just, just confirms this, lays it out, and he, and he uses again this passage out of the Old Testament, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads grain. And, and he just lets us know, I mean, it's more than just an agricultural principle. That, you know, if an ox is plowing, it should be able to eat. He says, no, it's, it's given us a principle that's so much for us that if someone's investing their life into the, the kingdom of God and serving with it, you know, it makes altogether sense that in one sense that they should be provided for in so doing, that it should be able to meet them in, 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 as they're doing it that way. Again, Paul's telling us that this is a right that he has naturally. Everybody knows it. It makes sense. It's a biblical principle. And, and even in the midst of that, it's one that was universal. It tells us in verse 12, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Quick pause again. He's telling us others have this. I mean, other people who are serving God, others who are operating in those capacities as, as serving God as, as, as missionaries and taking the gospel out there, they were being just supported in so doing. And he lets us know that Others were doing that as well. It says, nevertheless, in the middle of verse 12, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, those are, you know, high enough all by themselves that it makes sense that it's just the way the world works. It's natural. It's biblical. It's universal. Others get that. But if that wasn't high enough, he takes us to the far greatest part of it all, that it was something that Jesus himself endorsed. For he tells us there in verse 13, do we not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the, altar, the offerings of the altar? It says in the Old Testament, it worked that way. Priests and Levites who served, it was part of the way that God provided for them as they partook part of those offerings. Even so, verse 14, 
the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So this is exactly what God called, and he made it a command. It was to his disciples that way. When Jesus sent out the disciples, he had told them in Matthew 10, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey nor two tunics nor sandals nor staffs for a worker is worthy of his, of his food. That one of the principles he'd given to his, his disciples, he had said, sent them up two by two was, I want you to, I mean, it was part of the proof. It was part of how God would provide. And, and his plan for them was that. It was the plan that Jesus had in them serving. And that principle moves again into all of history. And he's letting us know again that that's a right. Now, again, I want to just pause, and I think you get it. I don't think that you're lost in this, but at the same point, I want to make sure you're not confused. These things are right. It's the normal way that things should be done, ought to be done, biblically should be done. Jesus has done it that way, called it that way. Most of the time, it works that way. Throughout church history, it's been that way, and it's right that it's so. That pastors, you know, are, are able to be provided for financially so that they can serve, that's right. I mean, I enjoy that. That's part of what God has provided for me, to give me the freedom to invest my time in this. That missionaries would be provided for. That people who are serving God, that they should be met and, and provided for financially in doing that. That's the normal way that things work. And it's the right way that things work. Don't get confused over that. Again, I hope I'm not making it confusing because it, it's not, but it's right. And it, it is a biblical right, a Jesus-given right, a, a natural right. All of it kind of work in there. And Paul wants us to know he has a full right to this. There's not any part of it that's wrong. There's not any part of him that, that, it, that in one sense that it's wrong for him uh, to be supported financially. It's altogether right for him to be so. So he establishes as firm as we can get it. This is something that is his just due. This is something that by all manner of, of understanding and expectation, it should be something that he could say, I deserve this. It's my right. It, it, it's my, I, I deserve it. It's the right thing to happen. And yet he lets us know that there's a place of forsaking our rights, that just because it's right doesn't mean we do it. Just because we have a right to do it doesn't mean we always do it. There are times to lay those down, and that's what he's telling us. Again, just pick it up in the, verse 12. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Going down again to verse 15. But I have used none of these things. Nor have I written that these things should be done so for me. It says in one sense as he's letting do this, he has chosen not to enjoy his rights, not to be in a place where, though he had a right to take financial support in, in, in the ministry he was doing, he's chosen not to do that, even though it was his. And he's writing, he says, I haven't written this so that you would now support me. You know, he's writing this, and he's telling us there's no manipulation in the midst of this. He says, nor have I written these things that it should be done so uh, to me, for it would be better for me to die than anyone should make my boasting void. Now, I just like that. And again, for some of you, you'll get it maybe better than others, because we live in a world where sometimes people are expert manipulators. You know, the kind of thing that they would say, well, you know, I... I don't really want to be supported, you know. I mean, I just, I mean, they say it in such a way that you're like, fine, fine, I'll support you. I mean, I, I mean, just make you feel guilty for even doing it. There's an expert way to do that, quite honestly. And for some of you, you've gotten used to that. I mean, I'm, you know, because of where we are in, in a church, I mean, we get those kinds of letters. It seems like an email's almost weekly, you know, somebody just, you know, and, and some of them are just really good at the way of doing it, you know, just kind of like they say it in such a way that just, you just feel guilty, you know, it's like, wow, now I just feel terrible, you know, I mean, you're just, you're kind of saying it and just, you know, you know, in such a, and Paul's saying, I'm not that way. He says, so much so that I would rather die than, 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 you know, cross this line that I've chosen to do in my life. I mean, he is not asking for their financial support. He has chosen not to do that. He's not manipulating them. He's telling them, I have a right to it, but I don't want that right. I'm doing that in a way, he says, because in one sense, as I serve God, I want to do so freely. As he adds to it, notice what he says there in verse 16 and 17. 
For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if it is against my will, I have been entrusted with stewardship. Now, there's a big concept in this, and be quite honest, we could spend the rest of the evening on this, but it's worth just quickly giving it to you. Paul, as he thinks about his service, it wasn't optional. He says, when I think about preaching the gospel, it wasn't that I chose to do that. God chose me. He says, so much so that I don't actually deserve any kind of kudos and pat on the back for doing so. He says, I'm actually in trouble if I don't. You know, he says, you know, for for me, it isn't this like, well, you know, maybe I could and maybe I wouldn't. He he says, you know, I I have to. I mean, God has called me to, to be disobedient to God's call. It becomes sin. And I just want you to understand there's huge understandings in the midst of all of that because it's meant to be that way in our lives. God doesn't take it lightly. I mean, there are times when, you know, you can kind of just say it this way. You know, let Jonah be part of the example for us. You know, I mean, there's not really this place where it's like, I I changed my mind. I don't want to serve. You know, it's like, you don't, you can't really quit on God. I mean, it doesn't really work that way. He sends out a big fish kind of a thing. I mean, there is this place that really coming down to it, that it's not that way. And I, and I, I wish I could say it more profoundly, but it strikes me deeply. And I just can kind of echo in my own heart and and just kind of a fragile and small way. I understand in part what he's saying, because I feel the same way. There's not this sense that's like, well, you know, man, I could, I could teach or I could not teach. It's like, I, I have to. I mean, it's like, if I didn't, I'd be in trouble. You know, I mean, if I didn't do it, I mean, there's, there, you know, God would be, you know, I know I would be in the wrong. I know it would be sin. It's not this free will thing. It's like, there's a stewardship. There's a calling. There's a pressing in upon God that where God calls us into what he has for us, where it's not that way. I don't know where that is in your life, but I will as gently and carefully as I can say this, that's not meant to be just for a few people. Ministry isn't for a select few. You know, the Bible is clear that all of us have been given a spiritual gift, that his plan for our lives is that we're each one to be a part of the body of Christ. So Ephesians 4 would say that the whole body ministers to the, to itself, each one, you know, serving in the capacity and the place where God has called them. And there's a place in your life, there's a part of what God has for you that is not meant to be optional. Now, I just know this. That's not the way every Christian lives it. I know for some Christians, they're kind of like, well, I could serve. I could not serve. (laughs) I could do, I could not do. It's kind of just, you know, if I feel like it. No, there ought to be a place that's like, I I don't really, I mean, mean, I'm called. I mean, God has called me to be a part of the body of Christ. This isn't a choice. This is this is, you know, uh, you know something I, I need to do. It's something to not do. It would get me in trouble. Again, I just read it again in verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. I mean, I can't really take credit for it. I can't really, you know, say anything great about it. For necessity is laid upon me. I have to. It's ne- needed. I have to do it. Yes, woe is me. I mean, I'm in trouble if I do not preach the gospel. If I do this willingly, I have a reward. I mean, if it was really my choice, then there would be something great about that. But if it's against my will, it's not what I've chosen to do, it's because he's chosen me. I've been entrusted with a stewardship. It's now this place where I have an accountability to continue and do what God says so as to not do it now becomes wrong. Again, he lays all that out again and say that there's no credit to that in his own mind. He's not looking upon being a missionary, being an apostle, preaching the gospel is something that he could say, you know, that I've done this willingly. It's like, no, I have to do that. But what I can do willingly, Paul says, he says, what is my reward then? Verse 18, that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. He says, in that sense, what he's doing is in that, that he can do this. He's chosen again to minister in that sense, quote unquote, for free. As he thought about how he would do ministry and how it is for Paul, especially in that society at that time, and some in missions still some way, he just thought, I don't want there to ever be a question that when I do this, that people would think that I'm doing it to get money. It is one of those things that sometimes is leveled against Christians, and rightly so, sadly, that some you can kind of look, okay, you said, you know, you're really in it for the money? I mean, is that what you're after? Because it gets there, and Paul has, has done everything he can to distance himself from this. 
Now, again, you, you might think about this, and again, just letting you know, that's not the normal way. I mean, most that go out to do ministry, it's right they should be supported and, and, and to do it, but Paul had chosen not to do that. And you might think that it would be incredibly well-received. Surely it was at times. Surely his attempt and, and, and just idea to present the gospel free of charge did incredible work there in the midst of Corinth. But we actually know that some just had a problem with it. Paul has to deal with the same thing. He writes 2 Corinthians, and in chapter 11, he says it this way. He said, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I mean, in some senses, they were almost offended that they weren't allowed to help Paul out. He says, did I, did I do something wrong? I mean, did I sin that I wouldn't let you guys support me in, in preaching the gospel there in, in Corinth? Did I do something altogether that way? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And again, understand this. Paul, he would at times work with his own hands. We know that in Philippians and other places. Other times, he allowed other churches to send support to him, but he just would never let a church that he was presently ministering to support him. He would never let, Cor if he was there in Corinth, he wouldn't let him do it. I mean, other churches would send to him, you know, but he wanted it there when he was presenting the gospel there, that it would never be manipulative. It would never be taken that way, and I think it's an incredible thought in many ways. He says, I let other churches support me so I could minister to you, but I wouldn't let you guys do that. He says, and when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. It says again, I, I mean, I allowed others to kind of do it, but I, he wouldn't do it there because his whole agenda, again, was to do this in such a way as to present the gospel without any kind of just pretext, without any misunderstanding. And again, it was his aim and still would be. As the truth in Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Archaea. He says, this is what I'm aiming to do. I mean, I'm seeking to do this because in one sense, his intention was that, to, to live that way, and nothing would move him away from that. So are you tracking so far? If, you, if your mind has wandered, come back for a moment. It was right. It was right that, he's been, that he could have been supported. It was biblical. It was understandable. It was Jesus himself giving the understanding, but he has chosen to forsake his rights. And that really drives us to the thing that what he wants us to understand is there's a place where there becomes a passion that consumes our hearts that's greater than I want my rights. There's something more important than, hey, I deserve what I deserve. You know, I, I, want, I, want, I want everything that's coming to me. Paul says, no, I've, I've done this. Why? Well, he had a passion for souls. It was really so much of what he was telling us there. Go back again and how he said it this way in, in the middle of verse 12. Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. It says we do all things so we don't because we don't want the gospel to be hindered at all. It says in verse 19, for though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became a Jew, to win the Jew, win Jews, to those who are under the law, as those as the as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law, to those without the law, as without the law, not being without the law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. He says in one sense, what, he, what he's aiming at is he had a passion that he just so wanted to see people saved. Now, in one sense, this is his passion, partly because he's an apostle, and, and I don't want to in any way minimize that or, or, or manipulate that, but I will say this, it is a passion that I think God wants all of us to have, that we would be more concerned about people's eternity than our own rights. And Paul says, here's how it works for me. I, I so want to see people saved that he says, I would become all things to all men that I might save them. Now, if you're tracking, and again, I, I give this to you quickly, but it's a big principle. This isn't a, a, a list that you can make. This isn't a kind of thing where you come up with a new law or a new way of doing things. What this honestly puts you into the place that it becomes a circumstantial thing where that his intention was to say, I, I want to do everything I can do to get the gospel out. And so whoever I'm trying to reach... 
I put as few barriers between them and Christ as I possibly can. You know, so that, I, that I'm thinking about it, that I'm trying to do that, because I, I want that to be that way. So if he was with a Jew and he was hanging out with them, he says, you know, though he was free, I'm sorry, going back to it, though he was free, you know, he made himself a servant that he might win some more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. So he's reaching out to Jewish people. So he doesn't go and bring up all the cultural problems that, that might be in there or insult their traditions. He's, you know, they're having a Sabbath dinner. He had a Sabbath dinner with them. I mean, he's like, yeah, I, I, would, I would walk in some of those traditions, not because, because I'm not trying to make a big deal out of the smaller things. I want to present Christ. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to walk in that so that those who are under the law, I might win those who are under the law. Though, and, and to those who are without the law, as without the law. So he's going to ministering to Gentiles who don't have the law. He didn't kind of press into them the, the, the legal ramifications or try to make them Jews. He, he, he walked where they were to be where they were. He, he did all of this to win them to Christ. To the weak he became as weak that he might win the weak. To, that I might become all things to all men. That I might by, some, that I might by all means save some. These verses, by the way, I should say this quickly, have been misinterpreted and misused. He's not saying that I'll sin with people so that I can win them to Christ. Sometimes people would be that, like, well, you know, I'm going to go and, you know, I'm trying to win them to Christ, so they're doing drugs. I thought I would do drugs with them. You know, I kind of just thought, hey, this would be a great idea. to kind." Of... No, that's not what Paul is saying. He's not talking about sinning. He's talking about cultural things and things which, again, are his right. He could have, you know, stepped into these friendships and these relationships and demanded and, and made it about him and his rights. He's chosen and said, I, it's not about my rights. I'll put myself in situations that I, 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 just because I'm more concerned about winning them to Christ than I am about me enjoying my rights. Now, ultimately, this becomes into this place where it again becomes a situational, circumstantial, and continually changing dynamic. If this were to be something that you embraced in your life, it's not like you could sit down with a rule book and think, okay, these are the things I do. No, it would mean every time you meet somebody, you, you, would, you would do everything you could to kind of listen to where they are, know where they're coming from, hear where they are, and do everything you could to, to present Christ as clear as you could with as few stumbling blocks as you possibly could, even at that times when it meant letting go of things that which you're, were your right to do or be a part of, you'd be like, no, I'm not going to do that because I want Jesus to be presented. The gospel never changes. The, the, the truth that we have never came, changes, but the style and the means by which we present that can change. That in many ways that it becomes that. And Paul's saying, I do that. And part of what drives him to this is this place of saying, it's not about my rights. Again, much could be said there, but I move past it simply saying that's his passion. He does all of this, he says, because he's doing that. And then he challenges us with this incredible picture. He gives it to us this way in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others... I myself should become disqualified. It's not a hard picture. In fact, it might help put it all together for you guys. Corinth was really the place where many of the Olympic games, the Iskian games really began. A lot of the Olympics and the things that we think about even now, it was very much a part of their culture. So he's able to tie into it. He says, you know, it's kind of like that. You know, here we have these guys that compete for perishable crowns, literally just, you know, wreaths that they would win, the honor that would be that way. He says, they do it for a perishable crown. We for something that's imperishable. And we do that in a way of pursuing something because we see something more important than our rights. Now, you guys get this, but we have a number of athletes in our church. And if you want to sit down with them, I'm sure you could ask them. You know, here's how it works in their lives. For, for many of them, they've, they've set something and it's become a goal. Maybe they want to compete. We have some that are competing in different places. And you could talk to them and say, you know, you have a right to eat a gallon of ice cream every day. You have a right to eat 14 candy bars and, you know, you know, four liters of Coke every day. There's no law against it. It's your right, you know, and they could say, it's, it's my right. Maybe it's so, but I would choose not to do that. I, 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 I lay aside things that I could legitimately take a part of. Why? Because I want something. 
I have my eyes on a prize. I have my eyes on something, and I lay down my rights, not because I can't enjoy those things, not because it's wrong for me to enjoy those things, but I, they would hinder me from what I want. I lay them down because I have something that is to me more important than me enjoying the candy bars or gallons of ice cream. I have my eyes on something that says it's worth laying down my rights to win that. And if people can do that for a perishable crown, Paul is saying, can we not do that for Christ? I mean, our, and here's the dangerous thing as Christians, sometimes we become so incredibly selfish. It's all about our rights. It's all about what I deserve. Instead of saying, you know what? It's, it's not about my rights. I, I'm after something. I'm after pleasing Christ. I'm after just gaining that. And he presents it in this idea of pursuing everything that God has for you. He says it this way at the end of verse 23. I do this for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. He says again in verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Understand this, Paul's not saying He's worried about losing his salvation. When he talks about being disqualified or being a partaker of salvation, he's not saying, I'm really worried lest I'm going to lose my salvation, so I'm working really hard. No, what he is saying is, I just don't want to miss anything God has for me. I want to be a partaker of everything that God has for me. And the Greek is quite powerful in it, by the way, in verse 23. It puts it in a subjunctive tense that has the idea that not everybody does. That there are things laid out for us in the gospel of Christ, things that are possible in our lives that would be what God has for us, but we fall short of them because we, we don't pursue them. He says, I want them. I don't want to pursue them and be disqualified. And you guys get it. It happens. I mean, we've seen it in so many times in Olympic games or medals, you know, aka things like Lance Armstrong or other places where people had, you know, rewards, had things, and then they've come and they've been disqualified. You know, and, and, and the rewards that were theirs were taken away. And he's saying, I don't want that to happen to me. I, I, want, I want everything that God has for my life. And ultimately for him, what is that? Well, he's told us he wants to see people saved. I mean, he's, he's after seeing as many people come to Christ. He says, I do all these things so that by all means necessary, I might be able to save some. He says, I, I'm pursuing these things in such a way as saying, hey, I, I want these things. See, I think about it, in one sense, he's calling us to a different way to live. Jim Elliott said it this way, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He says, he's not a fool to give up you know, rights that you're going to lose anyway when you can gain things that are altogether eternal. See, I come back to it, and I gave it to you early on. Let me come back to it now. To have the right to do something is not at all the same thing as to be right in doing it. Let's put it all together a little bit more practical. We have probably all asked the question about some decision we were trying to make in our life. I've been asked, and, and, and maybe you have as well, someone comes and says, well, Jim, can I be a Christian and still do fill in the blank? Can I be a Christian and still be a part of, can I be a Christian? And I, and I, and I understand what's being asked, but I just want you to understand it's a wrong question. I mean, it's, it's, it's a question about, hey, what's my rights? And sometimes we're there. I mean, that's just what we are. We're thinking, can I, do I have a right to do this? Is it okay if I do this? I get it. There are things that are there, but it's a wrong question. It's not a question of what's my rights. It's, God, what do you have for me? God, what, what is it? I mean, it's, it's about pursuing something that's altogether higher. It's about aiming at something where it's not about my rights. It's about having everything that God wants and saying, I can lay down my rights. See, I, I tell you again, there's probably not a week that goes by that decisions don't come across your life. And you make these decisions, sometimes all together just out of habit. Some of these are principles in your heart. And I want to tell you, some of you are making the decisions and you make the decision because it's your right. I have a right to do it. It's my right. I mean, nobody could tell me it's wrong. I, I mean, there's, no, there's nothing in the Bible that says I shouldn't do it. I have a right. It's the wrong way to approach it. Paul's saying, that's not what I'm doing. I have an altogether higher aim. And he's calling them to the same thing. He's telling us, you know, okay, let's run for a prize. Let's live for something higher. Let's, let's take these questions that we're asking for and not funnel them through, hey, I have a right. Instead of funneling them to, you know, what, what is, what's the best thing that I could do that would, make the, you know, that would help make the greatest impact? I don't want to do anything that's going to mess that up. And he's calling us to something so much more. 
Again, I think about it and just tell you this, it's altogether powerful and it's altogether transforming. It's where we're going to end this evening so you guys can close your Bibles and notebooks and whatever it is you have open. And I just want to bring it before you again and just be honest with you. You probably, again, for some of you, you probably asked it today. Maybe again this week you were wrestling through some question and you honestly didn't even realize it, but you were asking the question, you know, is it okay for me to do this? Is it right for me to do this? And that's how you made the decision. Again, I, I want you to understand it's not sin. It's a right. Many of the things we, we, we make in that are right, but it missed something. And maybe you knew it when you did it. It's like, you know, it just doesn't feel right, but I guess, you know, it's, it's right, you know. And now you get it. It's like, okay, there's a better way to live. There's a way that says it's not about me. It's about how, you know, pleasing God and impacting others. It's about what we talked about last week, loving God and loving people and letting that pursue a passion in my life that, you know, isn't living this selfish agenda about I want my rights. But it'd be in a place of God, I want everything it is you have for me. I want an eternal prize. I want things that are going to last forever. So let's go before God and ask that even now he would do a transforming work that would change even that in our lives. Father, we bring this before you and thank you for your word that though written to a culture that almost 2,000 years ago, Lord speaks into our lives right now. Lord, we have a nation that by its very founding seeks to enjoy and provide our inalienable rights. Lord, I do thank you for much of that and the freedoms that are ours here. And yet, Lord, where that's moved into our lives and have made us selfish and choosing decisions because it's my right to do so. Lord, where we've lost a passion that, that would be all things to all people so that I could by some means, by all means, win some to Christ. Lord, would you grant us heart that would have such a passion, which is your passion, the passion for which you sent your son. Lord, that you would just grant us that. Would you change us and meet us even now where that's not where it should be? Would you change us right now so that it becomes the pursuit that you have for us in this? God, by your favor, by your strength, would you meet us now and transform our hearts into the heart that you'd have them to be? So we just pursue you in worship. We ask for that. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. And though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. 
And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, it truly is all about you. I just pray, Lord, you would help us to get our eyes off of ourselves, Lord, to take the focus off of ourselves and off our rights. Lord, that we would offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you, Lord. Let's all stand for this last one. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Let's sing that again. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows. Clothed in rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
With all creation I sing Praise to the King of Kings You are my everything And I will adore you Holy, holy, holy Is the Lord God Almighty Who was and is and is to come With all creation I sing Praise to the King of Kings You are my everything And I will adore you I will adore you Oh, Lord Jesus, we worship you and just pray that you would receive all of the, the honor, all the glory, all the adoration, Lord, that it would be yours and that we would live for you. Lord, I thank you for the message that we've heard and, and just ask now, Lord, you would help us just to, to live it out. Help us to apply it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.